Thank you very much to all our speakers uh, this afternoon uh, for sharing, representing their industry, sharing their sustainability goals and initiatives. I welcome all the speakers to turn their cameras back on. Have a couple of questions to go through that came in through the Q and A um, through the course of the webinar today. One of the one of the first questions is is how will all of these initiatives reduce the carbon footprint? And perhaps another another way to look at it is is what uh, within your industry how is it moving the carbon how is it changing the carbon footprint or have the potential to change the carbon footprint? Um, perhaps Kurt, I'll start with you if that's okay. Um, could you just repeat it real quick? I got a little bit. Yep, for sure. Not double tasking. <laughs> Well, I think your your initiative speaks directly to to carbon footprint, right? Net zero initiative. Um, and so, how I guess how do you see it playing out to reduce the carbon footprint? Um, drawn out, step by step, continuous change down. Um, so certainly, there's there's you know some low hanging fruit out there, um, and uh, so that's that's the that's the initial thing. And again, a lot of that's tied to profitability. So that's that's an easy thing for farms to think about, and um, you know, uh, we all we all we everybody on Earth here can approve, and so I'm not saying the farms are only ones that can approve. We all can approve, and so um, uh, there's some things there, and um, they're they're uh, we know about those, and we've talked about them. Um, it kind of brings up Aaron the the topic of a roadmap, and we have a, a project that's parallel to this to develop a roadmap to our 2050 environmental stewardship goals. And so um, that roadmap will start to be developed after we have finished our work on our on our on our 2050 goal measurement uh, process, which is getting close to to to, to getting across a couple of approval hurdles here soon, and uh, will be off and running, I believe. But with that with that process, then we can actually start saying, okay, well, how many how many farms do we think will uh, uh, implement digesters? How many farms would actually um, you know, over above what's there now. How many farms would separate silos before manure? Those all things reduce greenhouse gas emissions from long-term storages. How many farms may implement or, uh, or uptake uh, feed out of once it becomes available? You know, what's the rate of adoption, if you would? Those things all go into informing the roadmap to, to uh, the goals. So it's a process, it's a journey, and uh, we're all in it together. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, the dairy farms will do is we'll, they'll respond to milk price. No price goes up, the demand goes up. Um, demand is supposed to go uh, up, uh, or exports are supposed to go up this last quarter. Um, and so those things go up and down and we've got a kind of a way of, of, of dealing with that in our in our tool, our roadmap development, so we can predict where we're gonna be at certain parts of time. Thank you. Uh, sure. You brought up the concept of a journey and Marguerite, that was an analogy you used as well. Do you have anything to add on uh, or specific to the pork industry? Yeah, from the pork industry perspective for reducing those carbon emissions, uh, you know, every single operation is different and what they can do on their operation will be different. And so what our intent is, is to provide producers a menu of best management practices for their farm so they can go through that menu and select the practices that are actually implementable and cost effective at their farm. Um, that way, those producers are actually willing to be able to uh, put those practices into place. Um, it's 100% voluntary. And so what we want to do is just make sure it's very easy for producers to implement these practices as well as as ensure that the producers receive return for those practices. Thank you. You mentioned uh, kind of the menu of options, and I think that's there's some similarities in the in the modules, um, Kathleen, that you mentioned in some of the framework. Do you want to add any any additional comments from the beef industry perspective? Yes, absolutely. So similar to many of the other initiatives, our, our biggest effort is getting some of those tools and resources out there to let people improve in their own time frame and what's best for their operation or for what's best for them. Uh, Kima and Ryan, anything to add? Yeah, I, I would just say that generally, um, you know, you see in each of these species um, some sort of organizing structure to help get our head around this. 
um, you know, different ways to benchmark yourself, reporting, not reporting, life cycle assessments, so figuring out where the impacts are, uh, and then driving that back to the practices that help improve those specific areas. Um, and I think Kirk, you know, lays it out really well in terms of what they're doing with the net zero initiative where, you know, they're figuring out where their impacts are, where their practice, you know, what practices can help improve in those different areas. Um, you know, I talk about, you know, being economically viable, being a key part of that. Kurt mentioned that as well. There's certain things that cost money that will help with sustainability that, um, you know, may be viable or may not be viable, but could become so if we're looking at innovative financing, um, you know, where there's not things available or where there's things emerging, proof of concept, um, sharing, you know, existing best practices, those sort of things. So I think it's, it's important that all these groups have figured out a way to organize themselves and in different ways, but in a ways that work for them within their industry. Um, and that to help drive that, um, you know, first start, you know, measurement in some form or manner, and then driving that back to the practices that will help you improve. Yeah, from, um, from where I'm sitting, you know, in the life cycle assessment stage, it, carbon is just one of many things that we're measuring. And so, yes, it's definitely um, an important uh, piece of the analysis. You know, you look at inputs, outputs, feed. Feed is a really key um, aspect of carbon, um, carbon dioxide emissions uh, measurement for at least for our sector. And so, you know, it's something that we're assessing. And then in the continuous improvement space, it's something where you can find the efficiencies that you can, you know, you can kind of capitalize on to really drive the best bang for buck kind of improvement. So I think you'll see that theme across all of the um, stages of sustainability that all of our um, industries are in and the way that each one of us approaches it it really depends on the particular inputs and outputs and the particular context that our uh, production systems and manure handling systems and feed systems are, are reliant upon. So um, I, I suppose that, that that's kind of a broader context for how we're all looking at it, but <laughs> certainly uh, a focus. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You can, um, I think it's very interesting the different unique approaches and, and paths that the different industries are taking, but there are some common elements across across them all that I think uh, the LPLC group can um, perhaps focus on, right? Where we have perhaps um, some, um, uh, some ability to address them across multiple species and industries. Are there any thoughts about zero waste operations or circular economies, regenerative agriculture? Are those, are those terms, are those practices um, coming through in any of your modules or BMPs or thought processes. I'll let whoever wants to start with this one. Respond a little bit to that. So uh, yeah, circular economy, you know, the UN uh, Food Systems Summit that's uh, coming up here soon, uh, we had a chance to review some of the preliminary draft papers in, uh, uh, within dairy. And uh, there, was, there was a lot of mention there of, of, of circular economies. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of there's a lot to say about dairy and its contribution to a circular economy. And, we, and, and, and not to say that the other species don't have that in some degree as well, um, but with the ability to reduce, to, uh, to co-digest on dairies, um, bring nutrients back, recycle them back to the land base, make energy out of them first. Um, there's, it's, 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 there's a lot of opportunities there for dairy to really start talking about how it really can exemplify in, uh, in its own way in a circular economy. Any other additions? Okay, I'm gonna skip to another question. Um, Marguerite, this question is, is geared to you, but I think all the other industries could perhaps weigh in too. Is there a program for ag engineers or um, technical um, professionals to become a verifier or the eco producer program or other third party programs? As far as 
just that opportunity for engineers to become verifiers. There definitely is. We need more verifiers out there. Um, I think this is going to be kind of the, the, the next generation is that third party verification. So I know there are a lot of programs right now where um, folks can go through to become those verifiers specifically to eco producer. That's one where I'd have to get them in contact with eco producer to be able to be trained for that. Sure. I'll open the question up to others. Um, are there other similar services that um, this LPLC audience might look at as a, as a service to the sustainability initiatives? Do you see the industries looking for um, collaborators to work with individual producers uh, on the metric side or on the reporting side or on the validation side? Do you see other, do you see some more opportunities? I can't, or Aaron, I would just say, you know, the dairy sector, it's, um, so we, you know, we have this innovative work and certainly uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work required as, as you all know, being an extension and uh, I know as well from all my years in that field of, of taking that, those findings, those sound science-based findings that can be readily implemented and getting it on the farms and implemented in a way, in a strategic way, so that it, so that it works in the long run. So there's a lot of need for people who can help with that. It's not quite quite what you asked, but it's definitely a need. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, next question is um, for the different industries. I think you alluded to some of this in your presentations, but really who decided um, what was most important to include in your in your goal setting or your initiative or your um, or your plans, right? Sustainability is about trying to balance multiple needs at, at a time, but they're they're all of there obviously is some prioritization that, that happens. So who decided what was most important to include? Uh, who decided what was most important to include in your program? Um, Kathleen, maybe I'll start with you. Yep, absolutely. Um, so our membership actually decided what was most important, um, similar to how Ryan's group worked. Um, we started out with a very large list. I think we had 340 when we sat down and identified them as these are really important issues. So it took us a couple months to narrow it down. We were told to narrow it down to four. So we settled on six and that was as close as we could get. Um, and we felt like that was a pretty big win. So those kind of have set the the North Star for us moving forward and guiding all of our work. Yeah, same same thing here. Um, the very similar process. Um, so our members, you know, from you know growers, integrators, and processors, allied industry, retail food service, uh, as well as you know some of the associations, NGOs, researchers. But I guess what was interesting to me is that I get to question a lot in terms of. Um, wow, that must be tough to have, you know, environmental NGOs in the room with, you know, producers, you know, how do you facilitate through that? And while, you know, the indicator and materiality process was not, you know, without, you know, taking some time and thought and discussion, I was actually surprised at the level of agreement that we actually had within our group in terms of what those issues are. I think you might see more differentiation in terms of, you know, how to address those. Um, but in terms of what the issues are, you saw a lot of commonality, at least within our group, within poultry and eggs. Aaron, I would just say that it, it, in dairy, so the Innovation Center for US Dairy, you know, which is made up of almost 40, 40 company members, um, they uh, commissioned a, a materiality assessment um, by a third party that was run by Joe McMahon at DMI. And they came back with findings, which then they reported to the Environmental Stewardship Committee, which is made up of a cross section of the US dairy industry as well. And then it basically was discussed heavily before those, you know, those items were put forth to a to a vote by the Environmental Stewardship Board of Directors. So that's how that was happened. Lots of dairy environment involvement. For the swine industry, it was driven by our pig farmers, so our producers. Um, but with that, the producers had a lot of 
consultation with academia, NGOs, as well as consumers um, to make sure that they were on the correct path with what they were going for. Uh, Kurt, what are co-digestion dairies? So uh, co-digestion would be, uh, uh, it, it, it can happen uh, on farms, it can happen elsewhere as well, like municipal wastewater treatment plants, but on farms that have dairies, so I call them, you know, manure-based digesters that um, would, uh, um, farm would bring in substrates from usually off-farm and, and mix it with manure and digest it together and create renewable natural gas, I mean, uh, biogas, um, which uh, is an energy source. So there's a lot of potential in different parts of the country for digesters, and it's not for everybody. Marguerite, a question about the swine industry. Is the new design and construction of sow farms with grazing access um, in the Midwest a strategy for also for manure management? I think one of the biggest challenges that we tend to have as producers is we put ourselves in boxes about how things should be done. Um, I, I think this is one of those great things where somebody's thinking outside of the box. We need to be open to all of these different designs and we need to spend the time to analyze if this is uh, good for the industry, but also good for sustainability, good for the environment and good for production. Thank you. Well, once again, I want to thank all our speakers for joining us this afternoon for this webinar. A lot of information in a short amount of time, and I hope that over the over the next several years, we get to come back to this conversation several times to keep keep each other abreast of where where things are going and how we can help each other and the roles that everyone can play in moving these efforts forward. I also want to thank Leslie Johnson for her work in organizing this webinar series. It's much appreciated. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day and has a good weekend. Thank you all for participating.